It's just so nice coming and meeting everybody and making connections with people and actually having a sit down conversation with them, you know, getting contact information and just kind of being seeped in the environment of a bunch of really intelligent, really driven developers. I mean, it's awesome. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to CPPCon. My name is I'm a senior software engineer at Garmin, and today we're going to be talking about thinking functionally in C++. So first, I want to set some expectations because anytime you see a talk with the word "functional" in the title, it kind of has some connotations about the type of talk that it's going to be. So I want to dispel those really quickly in case this isn't what you're looking for. So the purpose of this talk is to show you different ways to think about code. Is, is to get you thinking more than anything else. You don't need to be uh, familiar with functional programming at all. In fact, it may even help if you're not that familiar because what we're doing is not necessarily pure functional programming. We're not gonna cover any advanced functional programming or mathematical concepts. I may mention a couple of vocab words from here, you know, from time to time, but it's mainly just so you, if you wanna dig deeper into something, you can do it and you know what words you need to look up. Some examples may not be this is. It may actually be a bad thing to do, but the, the idea behind all of these examples is to show you ways of thinking about things that you may not have thought of before. Functional concepts are going to be interleaved with object-oriented and uh, imperative code, so we're going to switch back and forth. We're not going to adhere to one paradigm or another. But if you want a deeply functional talk, Mr. Ben Dean is going to have a functional talk on of the forgotten functional pattern, and that's going to be on Wednesday. So, for some functional programming, that's the talk to go to. So, with that out of the way, um, it's always great when the slides that you develop ahead of time tie right into the keynote the morning that you're giving them. So, C has something for everybody. Um, for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to focus on three different paradigms. So, imperative or procedural programming which is gonna have its roots with C. The object-oriented approach, which has its roots with Simula. And then functional programming. So the standard template library, lambdas, ranges, are all functional portions of C++. So that being said, here's an example of some imperative code, right? So we've got our manual uh, handle management with the F open. We you know, allocate all of our memory, we loop through a file, reading things from the file manually, we compare everything to every possible capitalization of the forbidden words, close things out, count it. Uh, you know, we're telling the computer step by step, this is what we want you to do. Do this, then this, then this, then this. It isn't really the purpose of the code, but we're dictating to the computer what we want to do. And here's the same problem, but done in a, a much more OO manner. So now we've got the file stream that's going to handle the lifetime of managing and reading the file. We've got the string stream that's going to handle parsing and reading individual words out of the file. We've even gone so far as to have a case ignore compare object that will compare and ignore case for anything. And then a la C Sharp and Java, we've got a console object to print things out to the console. And then we've got our functional approach. So here, everything's const, everything's passed through a function. We've got no mutable data, we've got ranges, we've got a lambda, like all of this is just you know, pure functional style of, of programming code. But because C++ supports all these paradigms, you can mix and match them all in the same program. Now, I don't know why you would ever write code like this, but if you wanted to, you can do the manual handle management of your file. You can use the functional portion to parse out words from that file handle. We've got our functional ranges and lambda in there to, to parse things out. And then we manually close and print the file. So you can mix and match these all you want. So now we get to part one. Identifying code functionally. So when you think about a program in a functional manner, you want to divide code up into some basic categories. And the first category is going to be actions, right? So the action code is going to be code that depends on when or how many times it is called. Observable changes will occur when you perform an action in code. 
So an example of this is puts, hello world, right? You call it multiple times, it gets printed to the screen multiple times. So it matters how often you call this code. Launch rocket. So when you call launch rocket, it launches your rocket. You get one shot to do that. So it matters how many times you call it, but it also matters when you call it because the rocket better be transported to the launch pad and it better already be uh, fueled before you call launch, otherwise nothing's gonna happen. It matters both when and how many times you call. And x equals four, now, a simple variable assignment, right? You are taking the value four and you are assigning it to x. You are making a change, so it is an action. The next broad category is calculations. So in functional parlance, this would be considered pure functions. So calculations are gonna depend only on their input values and they do not depend on how often or when they're called. So for the same given set of input values, you will always get the same value back. And no observable changes outside of the calculations will occur. Example, standard plus. Every single time you pass in two and four, you're gonna get six back. Is even integer. For any given integer value, you will always get back the same value. And extending that, for any given set of integers, the all of function will always return the same value as well. And then the, the final category kind of underpinning um, all of this is gonna be data. So in functional programming, you'll hear a lot about immutability and never changing things. So data is gonna be unchanging records of events. So it's gonna be used as inputs to calculations and actions, and it's going to record the results of those calculations and actions. So an example is here's just a list of, list of numbers, right, it's recording data. Here we're defining data, we're not actually recording data, but we're defining data. So we've got a name, which is gonna have a first and a last name. And here we've got a struct that is one of three colors. Then, yeah, it's green, orange, purple. So why are these categories important? Why is it important to look at your code and identify these three categories of code? Well, actions are necessary for programs to run or to do anything useful. So the, the whole concept, concept of functional programmers don't ever have side effects. You, you can't write a program without side effects, but you want to identify those side effects so that you know when they happen and can do it in a controlled manner. So performing an action has consequences, right? You don't want things to happen when you're not ready for them to happen. You want to make sure it's done deliberately. They affect how a program executes. You know, based on user input or reading data from a sensor or something like that, you might exercise different paths of code based on that information. Calculations. So calculations are going to be reliable, right? They're going to every, it's going to get the same value every single time you put the same thing in. They're encapsulated, so they have no visible effects outside of themselves. They're inherently thread safe depending on how they're used, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but because you get the same thing for the same inputs all the time, there's no ordering or memory locking or anything necessary for pure calculations. And then data is gonna be our fundamental building block, right? It's going to be immutable. It's not gonna change. It's gonna record the results of these actions and calculations. It's transparent. So like when you're looking at that name structure, you can look at it and you can see that it's got a first name and a last name. You can see through the data. But along with that is it's open to interpretation, right? So a first name and a last name, you know, it could be Brian Ruth, and to me, that means uh, I need to be here to, to give the talk, but for you, it means that's the guy who's gonna be on stage talking to me. So the same data is gonna have different meanings to different people. And it's, like I said, underpinning, it's used by calculations and actions to communicate with other calculations and actions. So question, is a variable data? I'm gonna contend it's not. It's cut now. Okay. That's gonna hurt my walking around. Uh, so a variable is gonna be a shorthand for, uh, for referencing the result of a calculation or an action. So here we've got just the statement two plus two, right? So we're not saving the value anywhere, we're just running the calculation plus. And the result of that's gonna be four. Now we're not storing anywhere, we're not saving it anywhere, but that doesn't change the fact that the result of that calculation is gonna be four. So here we're actually storing the value. You can see the x is, or the equals is there in red, and that's gonna be performing an action. 
So we're still doing the same calculation, two plus two, getting the value four, but now we're performing an action where X is now pointing to that data, four. So now we've stored it, we can reference it. So now if we do another function where we calculate X plus X and store it in X, it's really gonna be redo the previous calculation, that data that we stored, but because we saved it, we can now just reference it shorthand like that. And we still get the value eight, but now we're changing where the X is pointing. Now the X is pointing at eight. It doesn't change the fact that it used to point at four. That four still exists. It hasn't changed. It's still there somewhere. Like maybe the memory got cleaned up, maybe it didn't, but you still ran that calculation. The data still existed. We just can't reference it anymore. And then you do something like printf with X, it does the previous calculation, and you run it and you get out. And data is all about context, right? So on the screen, I've got a cookie. A cookie represents data, right? It's got a recipe, it's got ingredients that go into it, a process to create the cookie. It's in itself an individual item, and it all depends on who's looking at it as to how that data can be interpreted. So for a baker, all that ingredients is quantities and processes in a recipe. So they look at those ingredients and they think, okay, I need to put these together to make a cookie. For a clerk, they see the cookie as an individual object. The fact that the ingredients are in there doesn't really matter. It matters the quantity. So if I'm getting low on chocolate chip cookies, I need to make sure that I talk to the baker so I can replenish my stock to sell to customers. For an accountant, they look at, the, at those ingredients and they look at the clerk and they look at the baker and now all of a sudden it becomes a calculation for them. This is a profit margin. How much can we sell it for? How much can we, we make on these things? Nutritionist, same ingredients, different reason. It's gonna be calories and sodium, and things like that. For the customer, it's gonna be an expense. You're gonna go spend money to get the item. And then for a monster, it's food. So with what we've learned so far with breaking down things with actions, calculations, and data, let's break down a problem here. So Barb's Bakery wants to give their employees this awesome new benefit, right? So they've got a company that contacted them that gives them discounts on local restaurants, changes on a quarterly basis, and they've been doing really well. So for every year someone has ser in service, they're going to give them $10 towards that gift card. And to make it even nicer, they want to print out a nice birthday card for them. Barb's going to sign it, put it in their mailbox. So when they come into work on their birthday, they'll have a nice little thing waiting for them. So let's break down this problem, right? So the first thing we need to do is get a list of all the employees whose birthday is this week. Then we need to get the current gift card options. Next is determining the amount of the gift card. And finally, we wanna print out our, our gift our card and give it to them. So with that being said, how many people think that the first item is going to be an action? Raise your hands, anyone? No. What about a calculation? Data? It's gonna be an action. Because every single time we call that, it's going to depend on when we call it. Because if we call it next week, we may have a different list of employees than we had the week before. People will retire, people will get hired, people will leave. So when we call this function actually does matter. So what about getting the gift card options? How many people think it's gonna be an action? Calculation? Data. No? Okay. It's gonna be an action, right? Depending on what deals, what quarter it is, we have to get the gift card options, they may change. So that's an action as well. How about determining the gift card amount? Action? Calculation? It's a calculation. Yep. Given, so basically, if you look at it as given a, a date and a range of dates and a dollar amount, calculate something. So for any given date, any given range, and any given dollar amount, it will give you the same value every single time. And then printing out a birthday card, that's printing out something physical. We don't want to print out multiple cards for the same person, print it out too late. So it matters both when and how many times you do that. So this is kind of a high overview of this problem. Let's kind of zoom in on just one small portion of it. So we identified this as being an action, right? So the first thing we're going to do, getting a current list of employees, we identified that as an action, so that's an action. But that is going to generate some data that is now the list of all employees at that current time that you called everything. The next thing we need to do is get the dates for the current week. So we're going to have that, and that's going to generate the beginning and end dates of the week. So we got another set of data that we can operate on. And now we want to determine who, which of those employees have a birthday that is within those two dates. 
So that's going to be a calculation because basically we're saying, given a list of employees, all of which have some birthday and a begin and end day, give me the list of employees that is going to have birthdays between the two dates. So we take the data that is the list of all employees, the begin and end date, feed that into the calculation, which then generates our final thing, which is going to be the list of employees with a birthday in those dates. But how you implement things matters. So here's a possible implementation of that, right? So we've got this get current employees and get this week date range. We identified those in the previous slide as being actions, right? So we have also this copy if, which we're using to determine which people have birthdays within the date range. And that's going to be a calculation. But because the get birthday employees this week function calls actions, that means it itself is an action. So actions have this tendency to spread. So if you have a function that calls something that's an action or a calculate, or, you know, and it keeps trickling down until the highest level. So that also makes main an action. And main is pretty much always going to be an action. It's kind of a given that the thing that kicks off your program is going to do something. So you kind of take that one for granted. Here's another possible implementation. Exact same process, but a different way of looking at it. So again, we've got the get this week date range and current employees, but we move those up into main. Since main is already inherently going to be an action, we can move those up there and still don't change the structure of our code. And again, those will generate, generate those two uh, pieces of data. We also have this new function, is day and range. So it takes a day and a range, and it returns whether or not it's in that range. So it's a very straightforward calculation. We also now have introduced this lambda that's going to capture a date range, and it's going to call the is, in date range, or is day and range function, and we're storing that as data. So now we can pass that to our filter employees function, which again is going to have that copy if, which we identified as a calculation. But there is nothing else going on in that filter employees function that's going to generate any new data, right? We just have the local variables there. So it is going to be a calculation, which we can call from the, the main function. So now what we've done is we've taken, notice there's a lot more green on this slide than there was in the last one. So we've taken all of our actions and isolated them and moved some of our other code into calculations. And then the nice thing about lifting this up into a calculation is not only can we do that filter uh, employees, you know, all employees in the birthday filter, but let's say we want to determine how many employees are uh, going to uh, be here for a long time or have been here for a long time. We can pass all employees in in a different filter. And then let's see if we want to figure out who's going to have really big gift cards coming to them. Well, now we can pass a different vector of employees and then the birthday filter to get entirely different things. So we took that purpose-built filter employees function or purpose-built birthday function and lifted it up into a function that we can reuse. Next part, functions as data. So you can pass functions to functions, right? So this has been around since C, which we can thank for this amazing syntax for uh, declaring a function pointer. But here we've got a less than five function. We can store it in a variable. And that variable can then be passed to different functions. You can call it directly. So here we're just passing it to an increment if. And the standard template library algorithms are pretty much built on this concept, right? So we've got our algorithms that do something. And then based on the algorithm, at some point, they call some predefined fu or some function that we give it to do something in accordance with that algorithm. So you know, here we pass it the less than five. But you can also return functions from functions. So like any other data, a function can be returned from a function stored in a variable. So here we've got a function that actually builds a checker. Instead of just hard coding less than five, we can actually build something that checks less than seven, less than 100. So we've got our build less than seven, and now we've got a function that we can call that checks less than seven. You can call that directly, or you can pass it to another one of the algorithms. So let's take a look at these things. So the copy if takes a unary predicate, right? And it's going to pass the underlying type of the range that you pass to the algorithm. So in this case, that's going to be employees. So we take the employee and we create a filter 
that can take the employee that we're getting from the function, and then that will pass it into our end date range. And then that will pass it up to our end is day in range function. Now, what we're doing here is we have a filter that relies on a day and a range, but we're getting employees, so we need to adapt it. The second thing is going to be that range, right? We capture the range as a, a capture to our lambda, and then we can pass that into the is day and range function, which then brings it into that is day and range. So what we're doing here is curry, right? We're taking a function, or we're taking a, a function that is supposed to have one item of a certain type, and we're using something that uses two completely different types to operate on that function. All right, bakery automation, right? So a few years ago, the bakery invested in some ovens that can do uh, automate parts of the baking process, right? The API to control is written in C, so they hired somebody to come in and um, make it so that it works with their recipes. The contractors were tired, and they're having a hard time finding people to work on it, and they run into some issues sometimes where the range doesn't turn off at the end of a, at the end of a recipe. So the manufacturer is constantly coming out with new features that they want to incorporate to their code as well. So here's a look at the existing code, the existing API, right? So we've got uh, you know, your typical C style where you have to um, reserve an oven and then you've got the first parameter to every single one of the functions. It's gonna be a handle to that oven and then you can pass different things to, to operate the controls. And so an example of the code that they, uh, they had written to do this. So here we reserve our oven, we get the handle, we turn it on, set the temperature. And if it doesn't hit that temperature, return minus one. Well, there's you know, an instance where, yeah, yeah, we didn't turn it off and we exited. So that's, that's probably why uh, it's not turning off. So not turning off, our AII to the rescue. Let's wrap this up in a class. So now we've got an object that we can pass it a handle and that handle stored as a member. And then we just have all of these forwarding functions that use that internal handle to go and call the C API. So we do something like this. We create an oven object. We can do oven turn on, oven set temperature, just like any other normal OO operations, right? And that's what our code ends up looking like if you can actually even see it. All right, so that's handling the oven won't turn off thing. What about supporting new functions, right? So there's a new function that got added to the API. We want to set the time, get the time remaining. Well, that's pretty easy, right? You just extend, extend the class. So now we've got two new functions that set the time, get the time remaining, pass the handle in there, we're good to go, right? There's our new code. Integrate it in. Boom, perfect. And that's one way of thinking about doing it. But every single time they add new APIs, you're gonna have to go in here and extend this class and make changes. What if we think about it a little different? Lambdas are objects, right? So here we've got a lambda that's kind of capture a value and it's gonna have a parameter other that's going to call and it's going to return whether the captured value is less than the value you pass in. Now under the covers really, you know, in the last talk I uh, went into this a little bit too, the one right before in this room, that the lambda is really kind of making this unnameable type under the covers, right? It's got a constructor that's going to have a value, it's going to store it internally, you create an instance of it and then you can call it with the call, op with the call operator overload that's going to do whatever you tell it to do. So let's take a look at our, our C API here. Let's say we have a Lambda that takes a handle as its argument. And within that Lambda, we have another Lambda that captures that handle inside of itself. And then we get a function passed to this Lambda and any number of arguments that could possibly be passed to that function. And then we call that function using our captured handle and forwarding all of those arguments to the function that the user specified. So there's our C API again. There's our Lambda. We can start writing code that looks like this. So now we have the oven Lambda, which is a function, right? It's a callable. We call the reserve next available, which is gonna pass in that handle. And now we call oven one turn oven on or oven one set temperature to 375, it is going to use that handle that it captures 
as the first parameter to all those arguments. So if you have multiple ovens or multiple handles, you don't have to worry about possibly some implicit conversion that turns a handle into an int or back and forth. You get that handle out of the equation and you can just call it like that. So here's it integrated back into everything, but we still have an issue now. So we, we lost our RAI. We lost the ability to turn things off when they're destructed. So let's go and fix that. So lambdas are classes, right? Classes define constructors and destructors. So let's say we have this lambda here. Internal to the lambda itself, we define a, a struct that has its own constructor and destructor. And from that struct, we return just an instance of it. So in here in main, if we just call, call the lambda, we'll get something like this, constructor and destructor. So let's change that lambda and let's make it an immediately invoked lambda, right? So let's just, we're calling it right away. Same thing. Let's take it one step further. So now we have this R-A-I-A-I-I, -I -I, one of the best acronyms in programming, um, lambda that's going to capture that immediately invoked lambda that we previously created. So now we have a capture inside of this RAAI that's going to capture the return of that value. And now we have another parameter value and it's going to print off execution. You run it, RAAI 5. You get something like this, constructor, execute, destructor. So what does that gain us? Here's that oven lambda that we had previously. If we add a second capture to that lambda and inside that we store the oven handle and we make a destructor that's going to make sure it calls oven turn off or oven release, we've essentially made an RAII extensible object just from a lambda. You don't have to, as new functions are added, you can just call them. You don't have to go and you know, edit your classes or anything like that. You can literally just call them and they will have RAI semantics and support any new functions in the future. Composable functions. So one thing with functional programming is the ability to take functions that have kind of a very well-defined purpose and then chain those functions together to produce something that's kind of a cumulative effect across those functions. So each individual function probably isn't gonna do exactly what you want it to do, but the combination of a series of functions will eventually get you to what you wanna do. And the three main types of functions that kind of are at the core toolbox of most functional programming. So the first is filter, right? So filtering is taking any list of items and based on some conditions, creating another list of items that's either going to be less than or equal to the original list size, but maintaining the same type. Canonically in C++, we've always used this as copy if. Copy if is kind of what our filter used to be. The next big category or big function is going to be map. So we want to take a list of items of one type and create a second list of items of the exact same size, but running those items through some type of change or turning them into a different type. And canonically, that's been transform. And then the last big one is going to be reduce. So you've heard this filter map reduce you know, over and over with, with functional programming. It, it takes a list of items and it condenses it down to a single value. So historically, that's been accumulate. And you know, recently, we've added reduce, which is more designed towards parallel code. Um, but for the most part, accumulate's been kind of our, our workhorse for many years. So back to the bakery. Mars Banana Bread is one of their most popular products. So they've decided that it's worth investing in some type of automated machine that'll go through their inventory, choose the ripe bananas, peel them, mash them, and get all the banana, mashed banana prep ready to go so that when the bakers get in the morning, they can just hit the ground running. And they decided that the banana processor 5000 is definitely the way to go because it's got the most uh, bells and whistles. You can program it any way you want. So let's take a look at this composable function, smashing banana. So first we want to get our current inventory. This is the most uh, eye chart slide of all of them. <laughs> um, so first thing we're going to do is going to get our inventory. We're going to filter for is a banana. And that's going to generate some data, all the bananas. 
So here you can see there's a, a copy if, and there's our vector of all the bananas. Next thing we want to do is we want to filter them to see if they're ripe, generating a list of ripe bananas. There again is our copy if. Next thing is going to be mapping, right? We want to peel all these bananas. So we want to map them over peel. It's going to generate a list of peeled bananas. And there's our transform. So we're going to go through and we're going to transform the previous vector into the one of peeled bananas. And then finally, we want to reduce it. We want to mash all these bananas. And we're going to get an ingredient of mashed bananas. And there's going to be our accumulate where we're mashing the bananas and adding into an ingredient and then returning the list of mashed bananas or returning the mashed banana ingredient from this function. So going back to the employees filter, right? So this was a filter that was designed to take a list of employees and filter them out somehow. It takes a vector of employees and a filter and creates a new vector. We can genericize that, right? We can make a generic wrapper around that filter. So now we take a, a vector of any type and a function that operates on that type and returns bool. And then we wrap copy if, and we get kind of a, a little bit more generic version of our filtering. So here's our you know, individual items of uh, mashing a banana. And there's our filter function. So what they'll allow us to do then is we can replace those copy ifs and those separate vectors. We can now make those separate vectors const and apply just a filter over an array and give it a function. Along the same lines, we can do the same thing with map. We can create a wrapper around transform that's going to do something to each individual object and then return that back. So now we can replace the transform with the peel bananas, again, making it const, passing the right bananas, getting the peel. And the same thing goes for accumulate. We can make a generic accumulate function that's going to accumulate all of these things over and it's going to return the accumulated item. We can do that, make it cost as well. But we can eliminate those temporaries, right? So we can, we can chain functions together without having all these named temporaries in there. It's just the, the thought process behind it is a little bit weird, right? So you have to start from the inside and work your way out. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the current inventory, and we're going to filter it on his banana. And then that's going to return that list of all of the banana items. We're going to immediately take that R value pass it into the next filter. So I don't have any named variable, so I can just get moved right into that filter and then start going across it again. And that's going to be as ripe. That's going to return, again, another you know, vector of items that's going to get moved into the map function. We're going to map on it. And then we're going to wrap it all in our reduce, add the ingredients, return the ingredients. But we can take that one step further. So using ranges, we can uh, take, we can not only make it so that it's going to be a little bit easier to reason about, but we can make it so that we can operate over these values much easier, much more efficiently. So we've got our get current inventory, and we can pipe that into a ranges views filter that takes the is banana. So that's going to then take the data from current inventory and use it as a basis for our filter. Then that's going to return a view that we can then pipe into another filter that then is going to go over and check to see if all of those ones from the previous view are ripe. And then pipe that into a transform, which is then going to go through and peel all of those. And the way that you can kind of handle ranges uh, to do kind of aggregation accumulate is going to be fold left. So here we've got our fold left peel bananas and default ingredient going over everything. Lazy evaluation. So one of the nice things about um, a lot of functional constructs is that they don't do things that they don't necessarily have to do. One of the, the big advantages of something like a generator, right? It can, it can basically make an infinite range of things without actually having to have inf infinite memory to do it. So lazy evaluation, you want to delay actions or calculations until they're needed. So here we've got this data type. Right? It's got a type, and it's got this giant buffer that it has some type of data in. And we get the data, and then depending on some condition, we may or may not actually even need that big buffer of data. But the way that this is implemented currently, it's going to have, it's going to, have to allocate all of that data, whether we need it or not. 
So we could do a change to something like this. So we change the underlying array into a vector, and we've added this call once thing. So call once was something that was added to basically make it so you don't have to deal with like manual mutex management and making sure that every individual item is locked or if and, and all of the stuff like that. So once this once flag is set for each individual instance of this object, it will never call whatever's in that call once again. So here, when we get our data, we, may, we can set our type of the data that we have. We don't necessarily have to allocate it right away until we actually need it. So we get our type, turns out we need it. We then call get buffer. We do this call once, it's gonna allocate and fill the buffer and then return the buffer. And then on subsequent calls, we'll just return the buffer right away. So this is kind of going along with like the C++ credo of, you know, don't you, you're not gonna, uh, don't use what you don't need. So here we're not going to need the data sometimes, so don't use it sometimes. You can also fetch data lazily. So here we've got something where it's a, a set of cities, right? And you've got a map and a list of your current lat lawn boundaries. And you're gonna search through them and you wanna print out the cities that are gonna be nearest to you up to a max count. So in this implementation, right now we're calling get cities and bounds. And it's gonna go through all of the cities that it has in its map and it's gonna try and find all of the cities within its bounds, which may be a pretty intensive process. And it may turn out that in the current boundaries, you don't have enough cities to fit your max. So you wanna take just everything it has, or it may turn out you have too many and you wanna do less. Now you could easily solve this problem by just passing an optional parameter to the, uh, to the function that says, hey, only get me the 10 closest cities or whatever, the, you know, the max value passed to that. But let's think about it a little bit differently. Instead of passing in just a number to say, this is the number of items you get, let's say we pass in a function and that function is gonna get a city from each, uh, as we go through it, it's gonna get the cities that are closest to you and it's gonna call each city one at a time. And we can return true or false to say whether we want more cities or not. So the way you would use it is like this. So we call our cities in bounds, we pass it in a lambda, that lambda is gonna store num left and then decrement it every time we get a city. If it turns out that there's not enough cities to satisfy the number of cities we want, that has more cities in there is gonna just stop that loop and it won't call us anymore. Otherwise, if our num left, num left hits zero, we'll just stop asking for more data. So this is actually gonna have a little bit of a, a further advantage too, is because we may not only want to stop getting cities based on a number. We may wanna find the first city that doesn't have a Starbucks or you know, any other thing that you can't necessarily think of right now. With a little bit of extra effort, we've made it so that this is a more generic, more reusable function. So let's get back to this lazy evaluation. So for efficient iteration. So one of the powers of ranges is the fact that they use something called range adapters, okay? So when we get our current inventory, it's going to call a function that's gonna get out our current inventory, which is gonna have these items. It's gonna have an item iterator with its own begin, its own end. And then when it pipes it through, now we've got this view of his banana. And it's not actually gonna do anything. It's just gonna say, I've got this underlying you know, iterator that's gonna go over something, but I don't have to do anything with it yet. I'm just gonna store this iterator for now. Same thing with is right. Like it's gonna take the iterator from its previous thing and just hang out, not, not actually do anything. Same with our transform. It's gonna take the previous iterator, hang on to it. Then up at the top, we've got our fold left, which is going to kind of kick off all of this stuff. And we're also got our default ingredient in there, which is gonna be an empty bowl. So here's where the power of this really comes in. So thus far, we've created this entire stack. We've got all the way down to our fold operation. We haven't actually iterated over this, this vector at all. We've just stored different iterators up the stack. So as soon as that fold left starts going, it's gonna call begin. It's gonna go down to the iterator beneath it and it's gonna say, all right, give me your begin. And the peel transform doesn't know what's going on, so it passes it down to is ripe. Again, no idea what's going on. Passes it down to is banana. Passes that down to inventory. So now we're actually down to where we can do something. This is the first time we're actually going to start iterating over this vector. So it's gonna check the first one. It's not a banana. 
So then the banana filter is gonna say next, next, and now we found our first banana. So that's gonna come up to the is banana filter. That is the begin of the is banana view. That's gonna pass it up to the is ripe filter. Well, it's a yellow banana, so that is the begin of the is ripe filter. That's gonna pass it up to the transform, which is gonna peel it, mash it, put it in the bowl. Now the fold left algorithm is going to call next. That's gonna call down to transform, call down to the is ripe, call down to is banana, get the current inventory. Next one's not a banana. We found a banana, it's gonna go up. But now the is ripe filter is gonna say, no, this isn't, this isn't a ripe banana, I need something new, so next. That's gonna drop down to the get current inventory, next. That's actually the result of the next. It's gonna go up, up, up. And now we have some more stuff in there. And this repeats itself, goes down. Next one, over, up, 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 and up. Now we get to the next one. So it's gonna go next, go down. And now it's going to call next to the green banana. That's gonna fail. So now we get something interesting. We get next, and now we get to the end. So we've gone all the way to the end, so that's gonna propagate up to the next filter, which propagates up, which propagates up, and now we get a result of all this. So basically what ended up happening is that we went through all of this stuff, and we didn't actually, we only iterated over it once. So we lazily went over all of this without having to iterate over it multiple times like we did when we had all the name templates or when we were passing it via functions. We processed it lazily and were able to get much more efficient operations. So your mileage with this may vary. Now I had talked about like this is just for kind of getting you to think about it and not necessarily something that's going to uh, be the best practice for things to do. So an elephant in the room is you may have noticed that throughout all of the code that I've been doing here that we have been passing in these vectors by value. We are not passing them in by const reference like you normally would. So if you did something by const reference, yes, it's still constant, but underneath the covers, these things can change on you, which kind of violates the whole pure function, thread safe type stuff. So you could do something like this where you get your current employees, and for some reason or another, you don't want to make them const inside this function. You start running it on some background thread, and then someone clears it out from underneath you. So while this th background thread is still running, all of a sudden your data goes away. Another thing is that we have this local temporary here, right? So because this is a vector, as we go and use this back inserter, we're going to be adding more and more items to the vector, which means it's going to be growing and it's going to have to reallocate and it's going to have to move things. So we could do something like this where we go and we reserve the size ahead of time, but it might turn out that our filter doesn't actually need, our filter eliminates everything in the list. So you went and you created this vector, allocated all that memory, but you didn't actually need it. So you, you did that unnecessarily. Now you could kind of turn it around, right? So here we've got our vector that we're passing it by value. It's not a const value anymore, but it's gonna contain all of the information that the original vector did. And if you invert your thinking on that, instead of thinking about copying items that satisfy it, what if we thought about removing items that don't satisfy it? So here we go through, we iterate on the vector that got passed in, and we just eliminate the items that don't satisfy the predicate that was passed. And the key behind all this is that calculations need unchanging data, right? So if the contain type is cheap to copy, go ahead and copy it. That's gonna make your functions you know, more thread safe, more calculation based. You can guarantee the data won't change, um, but that's gonna require some type of synchronization outside of it. So you're gonna have to know something about those functions. So technically you know, that doesn't really make them calculations anymore because you have to manage when they're called. You can create some type of data structure 
that's going to be more efficient than a vector or an array or something like that. Um, a good example is a bitmap vector tree. So that's going to be something that, as atoms, items are added, if it's changed, it only changes a small portion of it, and it can keep records of what's going on. Um, you can Google that if you want a much more deep dive into that type of thing. So thinking functional. The goal of this talk was to get you to think about things a little bit differently, a different way to think about a problem. So C++ is a multi-paradigm language. So you want to leverage it throughout your code. You know, we've got, we've got a, you know, existing code bases that you see. We've got, you know, kind of like in the genealogy talk, we've got code bases that overused object-oriented programming. You know, you've got all of these different types of code living together but you can leverage different code for different situations. You want to separate and identify actions, calculation, and data. So these core identifications will let you reason about your code in kind of a, a much more holistic way so that you can isolate actions. So you can make sure that when things happen is when and where you intend them to happen. And they just don't happen by you know, circumstance or happy accidents. You want to reuse calculations. So by lifting things up into calculations, you can use them for more purposes than you originally intended. And you don't necessarily have to go all the way to make everything super generic so that it can work with any type and any instance. You know, you can see in the examples that I gave, I actually used a vector even when I went to my generic version. So you don't have to put forth all the extra effort to create something that does anything if you're not going to need it. You want to treat functions as data. Now, we've passed functions to functions a lot, but returning functions from functions is something that you don't see very much in C++ code. So treat functions as data. And functions can work together. Just because an individual function doesn't do everything that you need it to do, you can chain different functions that do portions of that together to get your desired result. You want to be lazy. We don't want to allocate memory, we don't want to iterate over things, we don't want to perform actions or calculations that we don't need to do. So you can make your code more efficient by being lazy when it comes to that stuff. But you don't want to be too smart. Now, a lot of the stuff we've heard is not you know, the best way of going about writing code. You don't want to put code in there that looks like those lambdas that capture everything else. It was more of just an example of how to think about something. Because Debugging is going to be twice as hard as writing code. And just by definition, if you write code as cleverly as possible, you will not be smart enough to debug it. So some resources to kind of, if you want to dig a little bit deeper in this, uh, Grokking Simplicity. It's a, it's a nice long book talking about just all of the different ways of thinking about functional programming without actually being very heavy on functional programming. The first like, third of that book really focuses in on those actions, calculations, and data. Another book is going to be Functional Programming in C++. So this is taking like the C++ ranges and concepts and things like that, and it's going to show you how to implement them and work with them in the C++ language. And this is a little bit of an older talk, but it goes into the, the views and how those iterators work and how you can compose different views together to get a very efficient, uh, very efficient range of implementation. And you can blame Jason for the, the capturing Lambda with objects, because Lambdas have destructors, C++ Weekly, episode 126. Uh, so yeah, I hope uh, you learned some stuff here, gave you some food for thought. And uh, yeah, with that, any questions? <laughs> We're not talking about monads in this talk. You want monads? Ben, right there, on Wednesday. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. I was just going to ask in the RAII example with the Lambda, uh, if you use move semantics, could you just uh, move the resource into the capture group instead of doing the immediately invoked Lambda expression? 
Um, maybe. I don't know. I didn't try going that route. Okay. Anyone else? All right. You guys got 10 minutes back. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.